Hello, this is Mrs. Kyler, and we're getting near the end of our um, semester. We are now in the 20th century with World War I, um, the disillusionment that came after all the idealism of the Victorian age. The poem that we're talking about this time is Dulce et Decorum Est by Wilfred Owen. And I pronounce it dulce because it's a Latin phrase, and they have a hard C in Latin. Some people pronounce it dulce using the Italian pronunciation, but the correct one is dulce. Okay? Now, just a heads up, in uh, Lesson 10, you're going to be looking at an overview of the 20th century. I want you to read both of those. The introduction to the um, 20th century and the overview of the Great War. Those questions will either appear on the quiz for this chapter and most definitely will be referred to in the, the final exam. So be sure to look at those. And also, reading about the Great War gives you a good context for approaching this poem. So that I'm not going to go over the poem line by line like I have done in the past. Instead, I'm going to just touch on some important things I want you to pull out of the poem. So I'm going to talk about types of imagery and provide you with some examples from the poem. I'm going to talk about alliteration, assonance, and consonance. Some of you may be familiar with alliteration, but we don't always hear about the assonance and consonance. Simile and metaphor, those may be um, familiar, but I'm going to talk about it in just a little bit different of a sense. And some terms from the poem. So what I suggest is that you have a copy of the poem with you as you go through this lecture. Okay, so imagery. What is imagery? Descriptions that appeal to specific sensory organs. So again, it's not just the fact that when I'm reading this poem, I can imagine what I see or I can imagine what I hear, etc. But the descriptions, the words themselves, tell us what they see and tell us what they hear. Um, in grade school, we learned the five senses. So let's have a little quick review here. Seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling, touching. Basically, the, sense, um, the senses are how we perceive the outside world. Now we use more, more sophisticated terms when we are, apply them to poetry. So seeing is visual imagery, hearing is auditory imagery, tasting is gustatory imagery, has to do with something biological I'm told, smelling is olfactory imagery, touching tactile imagery. And then there are two more that we add when we talk about poetry. There's also the sense of movement, which is kinesthetic imagery, and there's the internal sensation. Anything that has to do with internal organs would be organic imagery, like the lungs or the heart or the blood rushing through the veins. Okay, now I'm going to give you some examples. From, most of them are going to be from the poem. If I do not have an example from the poem, I just made one up. So here is an example of visual imagery that actually does come from the poem. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea I saw him drowning. Okay, so all of these things that I have in bold describe what we can see. Visual imagery, dim, thick green light, green, I saw him drowning, what I actually saw. Um, I really like that as under a green sea I saw him drowning because that first part is actually a simile using like or as and the second part is a metaphor because he's not really drowning he's actually choking to death exhibiting the symptoms of drowning because of the gas that's around him okay but to the visual imagery dim the green and what he saw so it describes anything you can see which would be colors shapes size etc I can't see cold, right? But I can see the blue glimmering icicles. Okay. Um, auditory, what we can hear. Beginning, knock need coughing like hags. We cursed through sludge. So coughing is something that we can actually hear. So that is an auditory image. 
hear we can hear them cursing as they're going through the sludge. Right? So that is actually auditory imagery. Anything we can hear. Okay? Then gustatory imagery, it's something you can taste. So it says obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud. That's when all the blood is rushing up from his lungs with the poison. So it, on its tongue, it tastes like tastes very bitter as the cud. And cud is something that we, you know, is regurgitated and chewed again and again. So it keeps on coming back up his mouth and being very bitter in his mouth. So that so remember, gustatory imagery describes the quality of taste. Bitter, sweet, spicy, etc. Sour, yeah. Okay. And olfactory, I looked really close to see if you can find an example. I had a hard time finding an example of something we can smell. Probably because they all are wearing their gas masks in the poem. So I came up with my own example. The smell of sweat like a barnyard full of pigs and manure reeked from the overcrowded quarters. So we can smell the sweat, and the word reeked suggests something smells really bad. Okay, so we can have this something stink, smell, aroma, odor, perfume. All of those alert us to something that we can smell. Tactile, now that is something that we actually can feel with our fingers, our hands, our skin. So her hair was soft as silk as he gently stroked the curls away from her sad eyes. So soft as silk is the way it felt to his, to his touch. So we think about things that we can feel, soft, rough, smooth, hot, and cold. We can't feel blue. We can't feel, I mean, as far as you can't feel the color blue, but we can see the color blue, but we can feel something that's soft, right? So think about um, things that the way we, perceive things through our sense of touch. And then, of course, there is kinesthetic imagery, and that's about movement. So we see action words like plunges, gluttering, choking, drowning, there in um, Owen's poem. And it's not just verbs, though. It could be adjectives like dizzy, or, and adverbs like sluggishly and, or swiftly. So anything that describes or provides a sense of movement, that's kinesthetic imagery. And moving along. Organic imagery. Okay, remember I said that's anything that is talking about what we feel with our organs. So here's an example. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, we're talking about the lungs there. So it's internal organs, what's happening, what we sense with those lungs. And um, so anything that we can talk about the pulse, the heart racing, blood flowing, lungs expanding when you breathe in, breathe out, nausea, stomach cramping, anything about the internal organs is organic imagery. Okay, so moving away from imagery, we're going on to alliteration, assonance, and consonants. So alliteration is when we repeat a single consonant sound at the beginning of two or more words in close proximity. So we've heard of the old Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers as an old example of alliteration. It doesn't have to be that um, pronounced. So assonance is a repetition of a single vowel sound within two or more words in close proximity. Remember our vowels, A, E, I, O, U. Consonants, repetition of a middle or end consonant sound in two or more words in close proximity. So they all are about the repetition of sound. It just depends on where it's occurring, whether it's a consonant or a vowel. So alliteration, again, is this repetition of a consonant at the beginning of the words. Here's an example from the poem. Bent double like old beggars under sacks. So we repeat the B sound. That is alliteration. Here's another one. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light. So the repetition of the TH sound. That's alliteration. 
assonance is the repetition of the vowel sound. And here's an example. Knock, need, coughing like hags, we curse through sludge. Now, even though knock, the O and knock, looks different than the ah sound in coughing, they look differently, but they sound the same. So that's what we're looking at. And floundering like a man in fire or lime, repeating the I sound in like, fire, and lime. That's assonance. A consonance could be at the middle or end, and it's a consonant sound. So here's um, some sounds. Towards our distant rest began to trudge. So repeating the ST sound. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling. So here we have two different sounds. We have the M sound in someone and stumbling, and we have the L sound in still and yelling that is repeated. Okay, simile and metaphor. You all know the same old um, definition. A simile is a comparison that uses the words like or as. A metaphor is a comparison that says A actually equals B. One thing is another thing. And so they're both comparisons. And the metaphor is actually more powerful because it actually says it is that thing. Whereas a simile says we can compare it. It's kind of like something else. When we think of this, we can think of that. So here are some examples from the poem using, this is a simile. It says, bent double like old beggars under sacks and coughing like hags. Um, just he has some really great examples. Or like a devil sick of sin. Oh, I just, that is a great, great um, simile. Um, just some really, really good ones. And there's a metaphor, it's a comparison that says A actually equals B, one thing is another thing. So when he says we limped on blood shod, so blood shod, shod means you're wearing that for your shoes. So the blood is your shoe. And so instead of saying um, our shoes were covered with blood, they're saying their blood was their shoes. Actually their boots in this case. And they have the blood for their boots. The blood covering their feet are like boots. Okay. Okay, so I want to talk to you about some of the lines that you may have encountered when you're reading the poem that you may not have understood right away, or you want to have clearer um, explication on. So the title, Volca et Decorum Est, is very important. It's taken from an ode by Horace from ancient Rome. And the words were widely understood and often quoted at the start of the First World War. So as we're leaving behind that idealism, of the Victorian era, we're moving into you know, being shocked by the realism that we that are we are confronted with in the war. Um, and basically, it means that it is sweet and right to die for your country. Dolce et decorum est means it's sweet and right, and pro patria mia mori is to die for your country. The flares. We talked about the flares. It says till on the haunting flares we turned our backs. Those were rockets which were sent up to burn with a brilliant glare and to light up the men and other targets in the area so they could hit them, their weapons. Kind of scary. A uh, distant rest. So that would be a camp. He says, and towards our distant rest began to trudge. It's a camp away from the front lines where exhausted soldiers might rest for a few days or longer. And the hoots. He talks about... Um, drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots. Those were the noise made by the shells rushing through the air. And he says, a tired, outstripped five nines that dropped behind. Those are the, um, the five nines are actually a 5.9 caliber explosive shell, and outstripped means they've outpaced them. They've moved, they struggled on past to where the shells could actually hit them. Gas! Okay, when he says, gas, gas, quick, boys! Poison gas. From the symptoms, it would appear to be chlorine or phosgene gas. The filling of the lungs with fluid had the same effects as when a person drowned, which is interesting when he says that he actually was drowning because he's having the same symptoms. 
And when they talk about helmets, that's what they called gas masks. He says, floundering like a man in fire or lime. Not talking about lemons or lime and limes. He's talking about white chalky substance which can burn live tissue. And often the lime was used when they built buildings. And he said, through the misty panes, he's talking about the glass and the eyepieces of the gas masks. So you're seeing it as if you're there's a camera going right through those gas panes. I mean those panes in the gas masks. And guttering kind of has a double meaning in this poem. And he says, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. He says, guttering, the way it sounds, it sounds like a man choking, like you're gurgling and stuttering at the same time. But guttering also is like a candle that's going out. So it, uh, it could be like his life is going out. But it's also the fact that he is, that sound, stuttering and gurgling, like, <laughs> right, really gross sound. And cud, it's interesting. It's that normally the, the regurgitated grass that cows choose, which is usually green and bubbling, that gives us an idea of what it looks like, the stuff that's coming out of the soldier's mouth that's from his froth-corrupted lungs. And when they talk about, you would not say with some high zest, talking about the idealistic enthusiasm, keenly believing in the rightness of the idea. We are the good guys. We know we are right. And ardent. You know, these children are ardent, aren't ardent. They're very enthusiastic. They're very keen on this thing. So that's the last of the poem. Um, please go back and read it and see if you can find some other alliteration, other similes, or other words that are very interesting. This is very um, a very um, full poem. It has a lot in it that you can find when you look at it very closely of double meanings and such. And it just really gives you an idea of the realism, the disillusionment that soldiers encountered in World War I. Thank you. Bye.